Welcome everybody to 22222 two, 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 Tuesday. So, uh, like I said right before the recording began, it actually snowed in Fresno today, which is kind of uh, weird and interesting to have snow piling up a little bit on your car. Never seen that before, just in the middle of Fresno. Um, we're going to talk about um, a little bit more on Veroni today. And you're going to take your current Veroni implementation and you're going to implement Lloyd's um, algorithm on top of it which uh, is kind of a cool Lloyd's algorithm. And it's kind of, a, kind of a cool thing. So what you do in Lloyd's algorithm is you start off with a, a, a Veroni, right? And then you move the cities or whatever you want to call those things, the seed points, you move them to the centroid of the region that they're in. Okay? And then you rerun Veroni again. And what happens is this. So let me switch back and forth between the two. So when you when you do Veroni, oftentimes you get these really long, uh, narrow, kind of angular strips like that. They don't really look very good. If, you, if this was a cobblestone, you'd be like, all right, who, who made the weird cobblestone, you know? But when you move, these, are, these would be the original seed points. When you move them to the new um, points, which are the centroid, the center of mass of each region, and you rerun Veroni, you end up getting a much more regular, kind of natural looking thing. And if you keep running it, then eventually the the, the C points scatter quite uniformly through uh, the world, and you end up with a very boring map. So it's important not to uh, not to run it too many times. But um, there is a zombie process. No, let's see, Veroni type Veroni two. So for this one, it runs Veroni, right? and it's like, do you want to do a relaxation? Lloyd's algorithm, right? And so watch, um, which region? Okay, here's A, right over here, Amsterdam or whatever. So the center of mass for Amsterdam is going to be somewhere around here, right? So the center of mass of a region is the place where if you took a, a pin and you balance the map on top of it, it would be perfectly balanced. And I'll show you, I'll show you the math on how to do a centroid in just a second. Uh, so I'm going to do the relaxation. You're going to see A jump up to here. K is probably going to move over to here. M's probably going to come down here. And then it's going to rerun the... Yeah, you see that? So A moved up and moved down. And we still have one kind of weird looking strip here. So let's do another relaxation there. You can see uh, if I keep running it over and over again, all the seed points just sort of gradually move outwards until you get a very you'll, you'll you'll basically always get the same map very close to the least um where everything's just sort of homogenized and kind of boring looking we end up with this this thing here which is a little bit interesting but it's, it's quite boring after a while um so if i rerun veroni it's kind of a cool map i like this one um and i do a relaxation um like once or twice yeah twice is even even too much Let's just do it. So this one's got like this weird country down here. So if you run it just once, you'll see that it kind of it kind of moves things around and makes them a little less sharp and things like that. So uh, that's that's your assignment for next week. Um, how do you how do you compute the centroid? Well, it's the average. <laughs> you for every tile in the country, you add up the you add up the row for that tile. Add them all up for every tile add up all the row values, and average. There you go, that's the average row. Do the same for the columns. <laughs> okay, so, uh, and then, uh, you know, so, if, so let me pull up uh, one note here. Let's see, Visual Studio is installed. Let's, see. Let's do this. So I have 50B, and we'll just come down here. So if you have like, um, Country looks like this. Uh, okay, and this is like row 10, row 11, row 12, and this is column 40, column 41, column 42, and column 43. Then you're basically going to add all the rows together. So that's going to be 10 plus 11 plus, right, 11 plus 11 plus 11 plus 12 plus 12 and divide by the count, three, six, seven, and uh, 
plus 44 plus 24 divided by 7 is 11. Okay, so the center, do you see that? How the, the average row is 11? Makes sense, right? Yeah. And then you do the same for the columns. So you're going to take 40 plus 41, 41, 41. 42, 42, 43, and uh, add them all. Uh, okay. My wallpaper engine's cycling its uh, background and it kind of pauses my machine for a second when it does that. 40 plus uh, 41 plus 41 plus 41 plus 84 plus 83 divided by 7 is 41. So the, that point there, um, I just dropped decimals, whatever. So that point there is the center point. And so like, let's say that your, let's say that your seed location was here before, what's gonna happen is the seed is gonna move to that point. And so in your code, uh, every city has a row and a column, right? Yeah, okay, yeah. they do. So what you do is like, let's say this was Indianapolis, it's old row location was 11, it's old column was 43. Now it's column is 41 and it's row is still 11. And so basically you just move all the seed values again, clear the screen, rerun, and you'll see you, you get a nice Roni, uh, a better looking Roni map in a lot of cases. And so Lloyd's algorithm is, um, again, this is all kind of part of the computational geometry part of this class. We'll probably do one more um, maybe next week, and then we'll move on to uh, more, um, uh, more bigger and better things. But I, I do, I do like going over computational geometry. You can take entire classes on this on this topic. Um, it's really useful if you're going to go into uh, data science, current day, <laughs> and uh, you know, like let's say, for example, let's say that you've got. Uh, I don't like this color. It's, let's say that you've got heights of different, um, just, you know, you've got height values, like this is 400 meters, and this is 500 meters, this one's 600 meters, and this one's 100 meter, and this one's 200 meters. So you've got height data from like um, some GIS source or something like that. Have you guys heard of GIS, Geographical Information Systems? Yeah. So, um, so let's say you pull you pull this data, right? And then somebody asks you, what's the height do you think here? <laughs> okay? How you know, do you see what I'm getting at? Like, how do you how do you compute that? Right? Like, uh I don't know. Like I've got a height here at four hundred, a height here at hundred, height here at six hundred, height here at five hundred. Um this one's two hundred, like how do I how do I guess the height here? It's a very common question, right? Because you don't have infinite density points, right? You have samples, and so if you have to interpolate between different, um, you know, random samplings and things like that, then it gets it gets dicey. And so one thing that some people do is they'll do this: they'll triangulate it, right? They'll do like a Delaunay triangulization, right? Where you create a mesh kind of like this. Um, but here's the thing. So like this point here, uh, since it's like halfway between a 400 and a 600, we would say, I don't know, that seems like probably about 500 to me. Does that make sense? Right, this vertex is 600, this vertex is 400. So, you know, we'll, we'll estimate the point, the height there to be 500. Corinthe, do you, do you understand what we're getting at here? Yeah. Now here's the problem. What if you, what if your triangulization ran a different way? Right? What if we did the triangulization and it just so happened to do it like this instead? So now this point here in the middle is like halfway between 100 and 500. So we're like, ah, eh, it's probably 300 elevation, right? Not five. You see what I'm saying? Like, it's, it's a it's an interesting question. You know, how do you how do you come up with good estimates for for things when you have a limited sample set. It's, it's actually 
kind of a kind of a tricky question, right? Like, which you know, which, which triangulation is better? You know, or um, do you do a quad? Or I, like, I don't know. Like, it, it's just it, it's it's tough. So, um, yeah, computational geometry comes up a lot in just a lot of interesting circumstances. Like, um, um, yeah, GIS is an obvious one, but like graph theory, um, this is a graph, right? <laughs> so, yeah, obviously there's um, graph theory applications for this as well. And also a lot of the graph theory algorithms run over, you know, uh, computational geometry things, like, because you have connections between points and things like that. So, like, if you want to see, uh, you know, an easy example would be, like, how many, you know, how many uh, cities are within two hops of this point, you know, and you go one, okay, start doing, like, a breadth first search or something, you know. Um, or another application would be if somebody clicks somewhere, like, if I click here, What's the nearest city to it, right? So that would be Veroni, right? So if you if you precompute a Veroni uh, computation for a map, then it's you can save that, and then when somebody just clicks on the clicks on the screen, then it selects the nearest the nearest city, and that's quite literally you know this thing, right? Now, it, wow, that's a weird look at that one. That's like the banana country right there. <laughs> I don't think I've ever seen a, a Verona quite that weird before. Yeah, but so technically, like, if I clicked here, right, um, it would select Denver, right, because that's the nearest the nearest city. Or um, let's do a relaxation. Yeah, look at that. Uh, that changed quite dramatically. Click here, gives me Frankfurt. Click here, give me Berlin or whatever. So, um Kind of, do you, do you kind of see what I'm getting at? Like these, these kinds of things are actually quite interesting. They they crop up in a lot of circumstances. Um, you're trying to do coverage, like if you're putting in uh, security cameras. Let's say you have an arbitrary polygon like this. How many how many security cameras do you need to be able to see all of the spots inside of the Art exhibit. At least two. Yeah, I think if you put one here, this one would be able to see kind of like I think it'd be able to see. Yeah, it'd be able to see down to here. Um, now here's here's the cool thing about this is that you don't actually have to worry about the walls at all. You you only have to worry about the the vertexes, right? So can I see the vertex? Yep, yeah, but this one I can't see, right? So we would also need one kind of over here somewhere, and then it would be able to see you and and you, right? And so that's that's an interesting question. Now you can solve it. You, you might not get the best you might not get the best answer, but you could solve it by at least um, you know getting a, at least an answer by converting. This is not a convex hole, right? This is a concave. This is concave, right? We've talked about convex holes before, right? Mm -hmm. Convex holes. We did it. We we did it in twenty six, right? Yeah. So we could convert this into a convex hole, and so what we could do is, anytime we find like a left turn, kind of like this thing here, they're like, all right, well, let's do something about that, and maybe I don't know, do something like this. And now we've got one con convex hole and one convex hole. And then one of the neat properties of a convex hole is that if you put a security camera anywhere within here, you can see all of the um, points inside of the convex hole. So that's a property of a convex hole. It's actually one of the definitions of it. So no matter where you put a security camera inside of here, you can actually see all the different points inside of it. So if you just are given an arbitrary you know, concave polygon like that, if you convert it into a convex hole or multiple convex holes, then you, know, you can just have one camera per hole, and that's an answer you'll get. You know, it might not be optimal, but um, it's an answer. So, you know. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. So, 
Um, yeah, these kinds of these kinds of things are, are kind of kind of neat, kind of interesting. Um, all right, so that is kind of our computational uh, geometry lecture for today. Uh, main thing is Lloyd's algorithm. Do you understand this? The algorithm you basically just average together all the tiles in in your country, not all the tiles on the map, just the tiles for Frankfurt or whatever. Add together all the rows, average. You know, add together all the columns, average. There's your average row, there's your average column, uh, your average, yeah. And then move Frankfurt to there, rerun. Like, doable. It's basically the same code that you have as before, I think. Yeah. Any questions about that? I'm gonna push that out to you right now. Ronnie 2 is still misspelled. Let me make sure there's not. I think there might have been some other thing in there. No. Uh, do, 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 do. Yep, that's it. Easy. You, you should be able to, like, if, if you know what you're doing, you should be able to do this, like, pretty quickly. It's not no, hard. All right. Um, yeah, just take it easy on you this week. That's, that's about it for that. Now, uh, one thing that I would like you to do is I'm I'm, I'm thinking about um, doing something a little bit different this semester with the two of you because you're both you're both pretty competent uh, programmers and so um, I'd like to maybe um, maybe do something a little bit different if that's all right with you this semester. Um, for one thing, I'd like the two of you to make a uh, repo, a GitHub repo and uh, practice uh, pushing and pulling um, source code to each other. I'd like for you to collaborate on something. Um, one of the most important skills to have as a programmer is, uh, in, in modern these days, is the ability to collaborate over Git. Um, Git's not my favorite source code <laughs> repository, if I'm perfectly honest with you. Um, there's some things that it is very, very horrible at, such as game development. <laughs> which is why you know, I like I do a lot of game development and so I'm kind of like eh, you know there's something called git lfs which kind of is a hack that allows it to work for game development but git git is really designed for just like source code and not managing like art assets and things like that so last semester we did perforce which is the blessed um, repository for um, unreal engine and it was kind of it's kind of a mess too so uh, I think I think what I'd like is to just use Git and, um, and and use Git LFS if we do it with like large art assets and things like that. So as kind of just a secondary um, objective for this week, because I, I don't think this running is going to take you more than an hour. Like if you just drink some coffee and just knock it out, like it, it's it's a four loop or two, you know. Uh, you, you both know how to average numbers. Uh, so I'd like for the two of you to collaborate with each other, and, and you can invite me on, on the project too, so I could, you know, be an observer of it or whatever. Uh, set up a set up a, a Git repo, and uh, actually, what would be interesting, um, what would be interesting, why not collaborate on Veroni 2? Because I'm not worried about you not being able to do it otherwise. It, it might actually be an interesting experience. Um, hmm. Um, whose who's source code do you want to start with, Stover or Corrente? Like maybe we start with one person's code and then the other person implements like the Lloyd's algorithm. And then you have to learn to read other people's code. And that's, that's a skill that I don't, I don't really develop too much in my classes because it's, it's, it's painful. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, you know, reading your own code is bad enough, but like, being handed somebody else's code and, and you're like, make sense of that and modify it. You're like, ah, you know, um, so what's going on? Before? So, uh, you have any preferences? Start with Crente, start with, uh, Stover. Any, uh, any preferences on whose code to start with? Um, I mean, Crente has his cities actually, what's it called? In, uh, marked. Yeah. I True. don't. True. That's, okay. That's not so let's take let's take a look at his then. We'll make this simple. All right. Uh, um, Frente, see Veroni. Run it. How many city states? Ten. Uh, yeah. Okay. 
Um, swoo. <laughs> the oh, color. Wait, yeah. That you're not resetting the color print. Eh? There, there is that. So you see how we got the uh, the orange left behind here. Um, when you when you're done with your code. Signed, unsigned, yeah, okay. Yeah, well, yeah. so it, it worked. Um, maybe, uh, yeah, let's do, let's do it before the last line. Signed, unsigned, unsigned. Right it may be better to use grant phase because I didn't actually implement the random generation. You have to manually input everything right okay. now. Let's do that. Then. So um, let's let's run through the process of uh, making a repo, and then Stover. What you're going to do is add Lloyd's algorithm to this. And Corrente, what I would like from you is to add mouse support. I'd like for you to implement one country being able to conquer another country. Okay. So um, basically, uh, you, you've done it. You've done it before. Okay. Perfect. So basically, this code is going to go up onto GitHub, and um, and then Stover, you're going to pull a copy of it. You're going to, you're going to change the code, and um, and then you're going to push it back up to the repo, and then Corrente will pull it, build it, and things like that. Do you understand? Uh, you don't have too much experience with Git. That's why we're doing this. So Git's Git's really essential to 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 get down. <laughs> um, I'll I'll post you a link on like a, a simple Git tutorial. Uh, the, at the most basic level, it's like pretty. Um, it's you know basically this kind of stuff here, right? So like, um, you just, you know, when you're working on stuff, you just say, all right, here's, here's something that's going to be added to, you know, the, there you commit it and you push it. And, um, you know, it, the, the, the workflow is pretty straightforward. Kind of once you get it all set up, it's kind of annoying to set up now because they eliminated password access on, on GitHub. Um, you have to get what's called a personal access token and that's, um, could be better documented. Um, they, when you try logging in with your with your uh, so uh, branches up to date, not staged for commit. Uh, okay. Um, what did I change in main anyway? I don't remember what I changed. So I could do like a git add main.cc and then I could do a git status and you can see that's ready to go and uh, and then I can unstage it if I want and then I could do a commit and give a message what changed I don't actually remember what changed so um, boo boo me and then I could do a git uh, commit uh, what did I do I don't remember uh, Better demo code, <laughs> and then uh, we'll do a git push and username, password, uh, yeah, that's what I'm talking about. So I have to get my personal access token. My lord, this is so annoying. Again, right, get push. Uh, there we go. So fortunately, I have my personal access token written down on my local computer, so anyone can steal it if they get access to my computer. Such a so much more secure now that I have this, you know, 
giant password written plain text. Now there is a password manager on here, but it doesn't cache it. I don't know. For I don't know. I, I just have to keep a copy of it because you, you saw it didn't it didn't actually cache it from the last time I did it a couple of weeks ago. Uh, ping Aaron to give a guest lecture. Yeah, get in GitHub crash course. Yeah, yeah. There, there's a lot of there's a lot of good good interest to it. But that's that's a basic upshot. And then if you were to go on to my GitHub now, and I, I haven't gone over setting up yet, by the way. Um, I'm just kind of showing you what, kind of what it looks like when you're when you're in the middle of it. Uh, if you come in here, then uh, you can see that my thing, better demo code, has just been uploaded two minutes ago. Click on that and uh, go through history and. Uh, View the old versions and stuff. I don't know if we care, but yeah. Uh, so and it has all the source code and yeah. All right. So if you wanted to get a copy of my read library, what you could do is you can come on here and do that and do that. And what you can do from like your local directory on SSH, you can type git clone. And then paste paste that, and then it'll it'll clone this entire directory. It, it makes its own repo essentially. But that's that's fine because you, you you just have a copy of my read lib, right? It, it doesn't it doesn't let you collaborate on a on a project, right? So so what you're gonna want to do instead is um, um, is get it get it set up so the two of you will be collaborating on the same the same repo. And then you can be uploading and, and downloading and pushing and pulling and all that kind of stuff. It, it, it'll, it'll be a good exercise for you. Let's put it that way. After after struggling with Perforce all last semester, I'm inclined to just let it burn in hell and just use Git. And if we if we do game development stuff on it, use Git LFS. So that'll be kind of your secondary goal for this for this week. Okay, just uh, get a get a repo set up between the two of you and. Uh, Corrente, I want you to do something that looks like um, hmm. Hmm. I don't remember the name of the assignment. So Corrente, what I'd like for you to do is this, okay? So I'd like, I would like for you to uh, have it, rather than it coloring the entire uh, province, I'd like for you to have it just do the edges, okay? So Stover will work on the Lloyd's algorithm, the relaxation, and Corrente, you're just gonna do the edge detection. And edge detection is, um, that comes up a lot too. Like all the, all these things that I'm I'm teaching, like they're you'll, you'll you'll find them everywhere. So if you think about it, human vision has a lot of um, like the, the visual cortex in the human mind. Like a, a big chunk of it is actually recognizing lines. Like if you look behind me over here, right, you you can very clearly and obviously see the line of the poster behind me, right, or the scroll or whatever you want to call it, right. And the human eye uses lines as a way of kind of detecting shapes and detecting objects so you know you can see that there is a rectangular eh, it's mirrored okay there uh, you can see that right here on the wall my daughter made a little bit of artwork and she she pasted it up on the wall it's a rectangle and even though you can't really see what it is from where you are you can still see there's an object attached to my wall and the reason why you can see that is because it's a slightly different color right the the door down here is like a beige color right it's an off-white um, I'm not sure why people like off-white, but off-white is usually the interior color of choice. It's a nice warm color, right? The, the, the color coming out of my light here isn't soft white. 
and the paint on the wall is an off-white and that's the paper is like more of a ultra white or a bluer white and just that difference in shade between the yellowish white here and the bluish white here is enough for you to just instantly see there's something attached to the door and you can see that because there's an edge between the beige and the and the white and it forms a rectangle and then your eyes like that's an object you know and uh, you would expect if I were to walk over I'd be able to take it off you know and if you look at the things the stickers back here I've got an EFF bumper sticker a China Peak bumper sticker an REI bumper sticker some people put these things on their laptops I put them on my wall behind my face when I'm streaming I guess that's where my programmer stickers go uh, Bedencourt I think has more programmer stickers than me but for me uh, Gibraltar hardware for drumming thrones and things like that they all, they all go up here for some reason I just decided that's the place where I'm gonna put all these random stickers uh, I've got some stickers on the ground actually that I could I could put up uh, today if I wanted so uh, get a thing you can't use your push yeah that's what I'm talking about so when you uh, do, 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 uh, yeah, you can't use your password anymore on GitHub. It's super annoying. And I, I honestly don't think it's more secure than the old method because now you have to you have to generate a PAT, a personal access token, and it only makes it once for you. And so you have to copy it and, and save it in case you need it again, like I needed it right now. Even though I told Linux to cache my, my authentication, um, and I thought I had the caching duration set for longer than you know what it was to. I, I probably didn't set it properly. Uh, fortunately, I had it written down on my computer in plain text. And so anybody who came to my computer would be able to just copy my personal access token and use it as a password on GitHub versus being like in my head, which seems more secure. I don't know. So uh, see you in court. So uh, yeah, so if you want to get a personal access token, what you do is you go to your things, you go to your... Uh, Settings maybe, uh, password authentication, two-factor sessions. Let's see where is it. SSH keys. Where is the personal access token? Uh, OAuth apps. Yeah, there it is. Person. Okay, there it is. So, uh, you go to settings, developer settings, personal access tokens. And then you can uh, revoke the, the, the pats, which is nice. Like if somebody steals it, you can just delete it and it doesn't change your password or anything. But basically you can come in here and go generate new token. And uh, uh, basically um, you can say how long the password's good for. And you can give you know different permissions on these, these sorts of things. And if you don't set the permissions properly, it doesn't work. <laughs> Like you need to have uh, um, permissions to like get the user lists and things like that. Full control of user public keys. No, but read, I think you have to read, I don't know. So like, yeah. Um, yeah, like the first time you probably generate a pad, it's probably not gonna work right and you'll have to do it again. Cause like, I didn't feel very comfortable making a, a pad that could like delete my repos, you know? Like I, I don't, I don't see that coming up, you know? So I, I didn't have that turned on, and there were some that I turned on that, or that I didn't turn on that I needed to turn on, and yeah. So anyhow, the, the upshot is, uh, yeah, let's make a whole thing here. And um, I'm gonna generate a token. I'm about to delete this, so it's not a security risk. So generate a token, and there you go. So that is your password. So uh, Corrente, what you're gonna do is after you generate that pat, this, um, this password that it makes is your password. So you're going to enter your username, Corrente, or whatever it is. And then for the password, you don't enter your actual password. You enter this thing here. And then that will allow you to authenticate onto your repo with limited permissions. It doesn't have, you know, essentially root access permissions like you do with your, your password. Uh, it has whatever pass, whatever um, permissions are granted on this personal access token. So I'm going to go ahead and delete it. I understand. Delete the token. Thank you very much. And... Um, so yeah, so when this recording goes up, nobody can use it to get the hacks on me. But that's that's the thing. And it only makes that password once. After that, it's gone. There's no way of recovering it. You can see here's my old pat. There's no way that I could actually have it print the thing to the screen. I can only delete it and then make a new one. So, um, but that thing that you saw there, 
co copy it I, like I did, um, and save it some someplace safe, I guess. And and you just use that as your password, and then everything else works the same on um, on your Linux box or whatever. Okay, uh, what's going on, Nika? Yes, you will. You will need to have. Uh, you will need to have something similar set up. Um, basically, uh, Corante will grant you permissions on the project, and then you'll be able to um, uh, push things to it. Uh, I, I assume he'll just give you, you know, the ability to push. But you know, sometimes, um, you know, if you don't trust people, then you can review. Uh, you can do what's called a pull request, and. Um, and you, you basically send your code, and then on GitHub, you can sit there and look at the code and see what's changing, and then you can approve it or deny it uh, if you want more control over your repo. I, I assume the two of you guys probably trust each other and uh, can just make you know unlimited commits to each other. Uh, one thing you might want to try doing is doing a branch and having one branch for the edgelord uh, part of things, one branch for the, um, the Lloyd's relaxation, and then after you finish it, uh, do a merge. And uh, that could be a, a fun, and by fun, I mean not fun at all, <laughs> but educational process where you um, uh, get to learn about the pain and suffering of doing merge conflicts and merge conflict resolution and stuff like that. Okay. It's all set up? Yeah. So, uh, colors, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so edge, edge detection is very useful. Um, basically, an edge can be uh, detected in um, a couple different ways. Uh, it's fairly common to do like some linear algebra to do edge detection. Um, simple, uh, simple edge detection though, like this. All you have to do is go across every row and anytime there's a discontinuity, that's an edge. You hear that, Krente? So all of these edges that are like vertical slashes like that, that is a discontinuity when you're going across a row. So you're going across and you're like, it's Hong Kong, it's Hong Kong, it's Hong Kong, it's Hong Kong. It's Detroit, that's a discontinuity. And so I drew a vertical slash on the Hong Kong side of the border. I drew a vertical slash on the Detroit side of the border. I colored it with a background color of teal and purple. And then Detroit, Detroit, Detroit. And when it's Detroit, 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 I don't draw any, I print out black, right? Black, 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 black. Okay. And then when I get to a um, another discontinuity, then again, I draw one side of the border and the other side of the border. And that's it. So that's uh, horizontal edge detection, right? You go across horizontally, and anytime there's a discontinuity, and for like image processing, that's like a threshold you can set. You can actually do um, um, like a threshold of like um, how big a difference is an edge, right? So here is Holmesorn uh, Castle. What's the image? Liechtenstein, is it? Okay. So, uh, famous castle, anyway. And so the, uh, let me see if I can find a bigger Liechtenstein. If we were going across row, that's not great quality. I want, I really need like a large size here. Aha, there we go, there we go, 6,000 pixels, I love it. Okay, that's much better, all right. So if we were going across every every um, row, right, where we're just kind of sweeping left to right horizontally, this is like blue, it's blue, it's blue, it's different colors of blue, right, but it's close enough, and so you have like a threshold, right? And so you're like, ah, it's like a little bit different, whatever, there's a little clouds, whatever, whatever, whatever. But look, right here, there's a discontinuity, right? It goes from blue to white. And so that would be over our threshold, whatever we'd set it to be. And we're like, there's an edge there. And so basically, you can do one pass over the image left to right, and you basically write down the difference in pixels. That's it. That's the algorithm. And, uh, I, you know, I, I used to think that, because... Like when you when you look at like image processing like research papers and things like that, like a lot of them are like, you know, you look at the you look at the 
the papers in there. Kind of like, they, they look like really gnarly, you know what I mean? Like, it's like, I don't know, like, uh, like they look, they look like just absurd, you know? And, um, and then when you get down to it, you're like, oh, you're subtracting the pixel value from one pixel to the next. Okay. <laughs> All right. I can do that. You know, like, let's see. Let's see. This is from Berkeley. Okay. So sine wave, wavelet, whatever, whatever, whatever. There we go. Yeah. We got like some, got like some Fourier. Yeah. It's Fourier transform in like, you know, got waves and like stuff and like, you know, there's like these weird Greek symbols and, um, yeah, it's, yeah. Um, I, I wrote a wavelet algorithm, right? And so basically what you see here is this part right here. And actually this one will be a little more easy to see. Uh, this, this part here is just the difference. Each pixel is set to be the difference of its intensity to the intensity to the right. So do you see how that creates that vertical line there? Because the original image, right, was, uh, was the original image? here, right? And so it's black, 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 line, right? Because that's, that's what you're seeing there. Corinthe, Silver, does that make sense to you? Like, this, this part of the wavelet transform is literally just the difference of each pixel to its neighbor, to the right. And then there's another one where you do it top to bottom, right? And so that'll pick up the discontinuities going up to down. So you're like, blue, 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 it's no different, no different, no different, no different, no different, no different. Ah, there's a line, right? And so if you look at this part of the image here, um, you see how there's these white lines that are, that are horizontal, right? Because as you're going down, uh, the top of the the top of the tower here you see that that's there's a giant discontinuity there right so right here there's a big discontinuity and that thing gets highlighted right so you can see right here that's you know and so you've got one that's left to right you got one that's top to bottom and then this one's diagonal so this picks up diagonal discontinuities okay. and when you do a wavelet transform which is uh, the jpeg 2000 codec uh, what you do is you take an image like this and you take the original image and divide it into quarters. Well, what you do is you do the left to right edge detection, top to bottom edge detection, diagonal edge detection, and then the top left corner is just a down sampled version of the image. And then if you want, you can repeat. And so you can see here, the top left, this was a down sampled version of the image before. So they down, they down sample it. It's now a quarter resolution here. And then they again run the edge detection horizontally on this part, edge detection here, and edge detection diagonally here. And you can you can rerun the wavelet transform as many times as you want. Does that make sense? This is this is image compression you're learning now. You, you didn't think that you were getting image compression there, but you are. So um, uh, so what is the most important data in this image? Well the this part, right? If you're going to be trying, if you're trying to recreate the original image, you need you need this, right? And if you if you just threw away if you just threw away all of this data, then you would just have a blurry image, right? You would just have a, an, an image that's been downsampled to a quarter of the resolution. It'll look blurry. It'll look terrible. Now, here's the key observation from from the wavelet people, is that the human eye cares about edges, right? The edges are actually really important, and so. Um, if you recreate an image and you kind of make, where's our thing? Did I lose it? So if, if we lost resolution here, do you think that we would be able to tell? <laughs> right? Like if I were to take all this blue here and just like throw away a quarter of the pixels and just kind of average it over. Yeah, you're, you're really, yeah. Like if you, if you like really like, you know, zoomed in and did a pixel to pixel comparison, you might be able to see something. But honestly, you could probably throw almost all of this away and just be like, it's blue. 
and then maybe just have a, like you know like for the clouds here and things like that you might just need a little bit of information for that so yeah so for like most of the sky because there's no edges on it you could probably throw most of it away and probably people wouldn't notice you know just like inside of the leaves here uh, if you threw away information on the inside of these individual leaves eh, you know like it's green um yeah you're you know what i mean like you're just not gonna yeah you're just really not gonna notice right um but what you will notice is if the edges change right so like all these edges here right if those change who the human eye picks those out real fast because the human eye is very sensitive to edges right so if i were to run this through like uh, have you have you guys ever seen jpeg um jpeg green artifacts you know, do you know what i'm talking about like when um when you like zoom in on the edge of a of something in jpeg let's see if there are any good pictures in here oh my gosh that's really bad um So let's zoom in. All right, so 100% JPEG, and then as you get worse and worse, the sharp edges in JPEG start ringing. And the reason why they ring is because they use something called a discrete cosine transform to do it. So they're, they're trying to represent the color changes in the image using, um, using a cosine wave. And cosine waves come back up, right? And so the more you throw away, um, of the image, the more of these ringing effects you get. Let's see here. Not super obvious. Yeah, like that. Okay, sure. So, right, so you have a straight edge here, and then it creates these ringing effects on the outside. Because what's happening is it's trying to, you're given like uh, things like a 64 by 64 block of pixels or whatever. And then JPEG, the original JPEG, tries to represent that 64 by 64 block of pixels as like a, a cosine wave over that, over that block. And the more cosines you, you kind of add together, the more accurate you can, you can store that, that data. But when you compress the image a lot, you start throwing away the extra detail. And you end up getting uh, just like one big cosine. And if there's a discontinuity, like an edge like that, then what happens is the cosine goes down the edge and then it comes right back up <laughs> on the other side and you end up getting these horrible ringing patterns and so it looks it looks quite bad right um need more jpeg right and uh so we'll take uh oops just minimize everything all right uh, close you uh, I keep closing this thing like it feels like i keep opening this thing up over and over again okay so here we got uh here we got this thing right now we're going to feed this into the more jpeg bot over here paste submit and <laughs> okay that's pretty bad uh yeah and so uh you can see these formerly straight lines are now quite garbage right um and so you can see these lines, which were before like flat, you know, they're now like blocky and, and things like that. And it really threw away a lot of quality on this. It's not exactly the most accurate, uh, you know, or the most fair to JPEG thing, but you can see how blocky it gets because it's throwing away a lot of detail. And it's what this website does, I believe, is it encodes it in JPEG, then unencodes it, then reencodes it, and things like that. So you can see that these leaves, like they've lost a ton of detail in the leaves and then you got these weird ringing artifacts on the outside and things like that. So, so wavelet transforms give better quality because what they care about are the, um, the edges, right? So you keep the colors and then you keep the edges, right? The important edges you keep. And then the other stuff you can, you can kind of throw away, right? All this data over here, we don't care about, we can just pitch it, who cares? Uh, probably th this, and this and this can all probably be, be pitched. We could probably recreate the image pretty well just from this, this, and this, uh, honestly. So that's like a quarter, less than a quarter, you know, of the uh, of the image. If we just, if, if you just give me this, 
this and this, not even this, I could probably give you a, a pretty good recreation of the, the original image from that. So uh, that's why edgelord is an assignment, because uh, um, doing edge detection comes up a lot of times. If you want to do, if you want to make a robots that, you know, detect objects in the world. Do you have any questions, by the way, about the image compression thing? Kind of, I kind of went through that pretty quickly, but um, hopefully it was it was entertaining for you. So usually robot vision systems start by doing some sort of like uh, image detection, right? So they'll start off by finding where the edges of objects are. Let's open CV. So you see that any, anywhere there's a discontinuity, then there's a line there, right? And then you can use these lines to group things into objects. So, make sense? There's a house, and then, and this is actually kind of how the human vision system works, right? Like, we, we typically um, look at, our, our vision system looks at edges, and then we group them into shapes, and then um, we basically throw away all the detail uh, beyond that. Um, if you if you look at like, can, can can you imagine a stop sign in your head? Corinthe, Silver, just imagine a stop sign, right? How many sides does it have? What color is it? So here's an interesting thing. Uh, your brain probably doesn't have, um, like if you imagine the stop sign like on the way to school or like um, near your house or near a, a school or whatever, your, your brain probably doesn't actually have a photograph picture of each of those stop signs. What happens is your brain knows what a stop sign is. Edge, 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 red, white letters on the middle, right? And can actually recognize it from different angles. It can recognize it even if it's obscured somehow, uh, partly different locations, things like that. And um, your brain actually pr probably stores all of those stop signs in the exact same place. Like you, your brain probably only has one copy of a picture of a stop sign. And it just uses that everywhere you know there's a stop sign. Like if you close your eyes and imagine driving through your neighborhood and there's a stop sign there, it's probably the exact same place in your brain that all the other stop signs are. It's, they're literally all the stop, same stop sign. The only exception to that would be if there's like, um, you know, one stop sign that's been shot up with bullets or something like that. And you're like, oh yeah, that there's that one place where there's like all these bullet holes in it. Exceptions and things like that, you'll, you'll memorize separately. But basically uh, the way that we work is yeah there's absolutely no reason to have to dedicate your brain power to memorizing the differences of all thousand stop signs in your local area there's absolutely no reason for that instead what we do is we our brain stores it as line 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 red shape that's a stop sign and we can instantly recognize a stop sign from any angle um you know and, and this is a hard problem for computers to do right like it, <laughs> And when you have autonomous vehicles, like you really want them to be able to recognize stop signs, like quite quite quickly, right? You know, like it's actually really important that um, you 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 see one, right, and you don't just blow through a stop sign and kill people. So, you know, even if it's like partially obscured or there's a tree in the way, um, you know, you really want you really want to be able to pick out stop signs quickly. And so, a big a big part of that is edge detection. Then edge detection feeds into object like shape recognition and then that tr turns into object recognition and, and things like that okay so it's five o'clock uh, i hope that was at least interesting for you um two of you collaborate get your git repo set up uh send me a link to it so that I, i'm not going to help you know do the coding but i want to observe and just see that you're both kind of working on it and you're both pushing and pulling to it and stuff like that and i want to see both of you making contributions to it and stuff 
And um, yeah, I'll push out this repo for you also. So this is called Edgelord. Um, and uh, don't worry about the um, don't worry about the whole Edgelord assignment. Uh, sudo deploy homework to is db. Uh, just get the edges, get the edges working, and, and it'll give you experience working together, cooperating together on a project where you're working on the same file even, which is kind of annoying. And uh, run it perfect, perfect, perfect. Yeah. And so Stover will work on the Lloyd's algorithm. Crunchy will work on the edge detection. And there you go. So we'll meet back here um, on this topic next Tuesday. Uh, on Thursday, Stover, I'm not going to be in person. Uh, the projector hasn't worked, um, you know, in weeks, and they still don't have Unreal Engine installed. So I'm just going to teach online until the lab is working because, like. You know, it's kind of hard to teach otherwise. So, uh, did you hear that, Stover? Uh, we're we're gonna be we're gonna be online on on Thursday. Okay. Okay. All right. Awesome. Did you guys have fun today? Did you learn stuff? Learn interesting things? Wavelet image compression. How GIS systems triangulate height data. Get compression. A lot of stuff. We'll grab back of topics, but yeah, should be fun. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for coming out. See you guys on Thursday.